Good morning, my name is Father Ryan Humphreys and this is COVID Catechism episode number two. And the title is basically, Who Goes to Heaven? Is everyone saved? You know, how do we get there? And so it's one of these talks that gives us a chance to look at what are some of the ideas out there that don't fit? What are some of the ideas out there uh, that, that we kind of perhaps just kind of absorb, you know, by going to funerals or watching television that maybe are not consistent with Catholicism? And what do we understand about how we get to heaven? First things first, let's do two quick vocabulary words, only two this time. Last time we had like 30. Two vocabulary words. The first is justification. The word justification we use to talk about God's act of removing the guilt and the penalty of sin, which we are due, while at the same time declaring someone righteous through Christ's atoning sacrifice. So justification is that process by which God removes our guilt, removes the punishment that is due to us to sin, and basically sanctifies us through Christ's sacrifice. And this happens effectively as we walk through the pearly gates. And so to be justified is to be freed of all the, the, the sin that we, all the penalties we might incur, and to be sanctified by Christ's redeeming sacrifice. Salvation is the other word, justification and salvation. Salvation is the means through which one is made ready to face judgment, to attain eternal life. And so salvation is that which we need to get from where we're standing right now past judgment, which is not just an automatic thing, it's not something that just happens, but to get past judgment uh, and ultimately to enter into eternal life. So we have justification and we have salvation. And if those things seem very connected, don't worry, they are very connected. And it's relatively complicated to get into a thorough discussion of what each of them means and what different role they play in actually getting from where we are now into eternal life in heaven. But thankfully, we don't need to go neck deep into that theological uh, discussion right now, all we need to know is that justification and salvation are the two kind of essential things that we need to get to heaven. And so in the back of our minds, we want to keep those justification being God's removing from us the, pen the, the, the punishment of sin and salvation being effectively the different, the process through which God goes to get us into the moment of judgment and then pass the moment of judgment into eternal life. Now, when we talk about salvation, there is a lot of, of talk about it in the Christian community, broadly speaking, because you have a lot of Protestant brothers and sisters of ours who have very strong opinions on salvation. Of course, that's a biblical word. And so we see and we read in St. Paul, in particular his letters, how salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. You can't get to heaven any other way. Jesus says, you know, in, in John's gospel, I am the sheepfold. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. You know, so, so St. Paul reminds us crystal clear, salvation comes through Christ. Now, Martin Luther made some bad translations of that, and whereas the, the, the Greek should read salvation comes only through Christ, or through, only through faith in Christ, the, the Protestant brothers and sisters of ours often translate that to salvation comes through faith only. Now that's not accurate because we see in the Gospels that Jesus puts an enormous amount of concern into what we do and how we do it. And in fact, in the Gospels where Jesus talks about judgment into eternal life, <clears throat> he talks specifically about works and actions being the criteria by which we get judged. So he says, when have you seen one who is naked, one who is poor, one who is in prison or in jail, and have you visited or not visited them? And he's, he basically says, I'm going to divide the sheep onto one side and the goats on the other, and the criteria I will use is whether you visited, whether you provided for the poor, whether you gave drink to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, whether you visited the sick, whether you visited the imprisoned. And so we have this kind of important notion of remembering that it's not just a matter of do I believe in Jesus in my heart, but the works that I do, the choices I make, which manifest and, exp and, and eff effectively make tangible that which I believe, I talked about that yesterday in the sermon, those things are a manifestation of faith. And those things are, in a very, very real way, part of the contingent uh, criterion upon which we will be judged. So that's the, the extent of kind of the big, complicated theological stuff. 
But it's worth knowing that we have justification and we have salvation. And salvation is not through faith alone. The alone there is meant to, to modify Jesus Christ, not the faith in Jesus Christ, but Jesus is the only way to eternal life. Jesus is the only way to heaven. If Gandhi is going to heaven, he's going there because of the merits of Jesus Christ. Anybody who goes to heaven is there because of the merits of Jesus Christ. He and he alone can bring about our salvation and our justification. So let's talk about some errors that are common, some other errors that are common. The, the most common error we see nowadays is what we could call the modernist error or the modernist misunderstanding of salvation, wherein we basically kind of get the idea everybody goes to heaven. Right, You go to your typical funeral nowadays, and the deacon comes in and he says, you know, Mama is in heaven with Jesus now. She's not suffering anymore. You see the exact same thing when you go to the Methodist funeral or the Baptist funeral. Or, or I mean, really, most Christians nowadays have this idea, this, this heresy in, in, in within them, that as soon as our loved one stops breathing, they go straight to heaven. And they're done, and that's it. We're finished. We're good to go. And, and this idea is utterly inconsistent with Christianity because Jesus makes it crystal clear there are lots of folks in hell. Wide is the way that leads to damnation. Narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Akita talks about how many people are going to hell in this day and age precisely because people have gotten out of their head the notion that we need repentance. We need forgiveness for our sins. And so universal salvation, the idea that everyone goes to heaven is utterly unbiblical. And it's one of those very difficult things to do because you don't want to, as a priest or a deacon or a lay person or anyone else, go and shake the hand and say, I'm so sorry that your loved one died, but they're not in heaven now. Unfortunately, if we do say that, suddenly nobody needs to pray for that person. Nobody needs to do anything about uh, thinking about their own lives. Ultimately, the reason we say this is because we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable, but Jesus himself went out of his way to talk about how being uncomfortable is necessary. So don't buy into the silliness and the error that everybody goes to heaven. They don't. It's not because God is a meanie that they don't go to heaven. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But the reality is that heaven is not automatic. And if it is, then nothing we do here matters. If heaven is automatic, then there, Jesus had no purpose in teaching us anything because there was no need for us to do anything. If all we need to do is live and die and we go to heaven automatically, then, then there is no purpose for Christianity. There's no purpose for religion. There's no purpose for morality. There's no purpose for the sacraments. There's no purpose for anything at all that Jesus said was so important and essential. And also, it means that all of the visitations of Our Lady going back to Guadalupe were lies and falsehoods, and it means that basically the entirety of Christian teaching before maybe 1920 was just nonsense and foolishness and has to be thrown out because it's completely inconsistent with this idea that heaven, salvation, justification are just magical. They just happen. That's a totally and completely inconsistent with biblical Christianity and totally inconsistent with Christianity that we know through history. There is also what we might call the Lutheran heresy or the Protestant heresy. Martin Luther had an idea that justification could not happen. He basically got in the idea that, that, listen, you know, we are terrible human beings. There's nothing we can do. We have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there's nothing that we can do. And there's nothing that God can do to make that better. And so he described getting into heaven basically as a smuggling process. And he basically said that Jesus would cover us up with his garments or with various images. There was one about snow falling on, on us. You know, the idea of being covered and then basically Jesus would sneak us into heaven, but we were never actually made better. We were never actually justified. He saw that as, as a misunderstanding of human nature, that human nature could never really be improved. Now, in 1997, the Lutheran Worldwide Communion signed a joint decree on uh, justification with the Catholic Church, wherein we tried to argue that we have basically the same belief 
you know, given a lot of theological language, we could say that, but Martin Luther certainly did not. And a lot of our, you know, kind of our general Bible Christians, you know, our general Baptist brothers and sisters, good folks that they are, still have the strong belief that the, that the human body, the human soul rather, can never really be made right. There can never be real justification. And basically you just go to heaven and that's the story. That's all we worry about and everything else is kind of moot. And so we do have kind of an idea that we can never really be made to be purified, uh, which is its own kind of, of problem. Now, John Calvin, who is really the father of most modern Baptists and most modern evangelicals in the United States, may be something more in line with what we think of, and that is the notion of predestination. And Calvin argued that basically folks who, who are made to go to heaven are made to go to heaven. And so if you are baptized, that means that from all time you were saved. You are already saved, and your baptism simply ratifies that. And so when you hear someone, our brothers and sisters who are Protestants say, I'm saved by the grace of Jesus, what they're actually arguing is that they were predestined to be saved from all time, and now they have ratified that. They've become aware of that, and so in that ratification, now they are going to heaven. Now, that's a big problem because... That, that if I'm saved now, then, then it means all of my sins don't really matter. It means that, that what I do, whether I repented of those sins, is irrelevant. Because for Calvin, anybody who would be baptized would already have the disposition of soul to basically have kind of a, you know, kind of a, a spray coat on the inside where the effects of sin would not really stick to us. And you still have that idea now where you say, oh, Jesus ignores my sins, doesn't know what my sins are. You know, and, and there are, are countless jokes, which I, I don't really find all that funny, you know, about, about you know, what do you, you have two Baptists at the liquor store or whatever, which I don't think really, you know, do anybody any service. But this, this error, this way of thinking is that salvation is something that's just baked into us. And it has no dependency whatsoever upon the way that we live our lives, upon our prayer life, or even upon our belief. You know, if, if I'm saved and I one day decide that Rastafarianism, wherein Bob Marley decided that some random politician from Ethiopia was the second coming of Jesus, and I basically begin to follow that religion, as long as I'm saved, it doesn't matter. I don't have to worship Jesus in spirit and truth. And if I do fall off the wagon, you have some folks who talk about backsliding, you end up with this kind of extremely convoluted way of thinking where you say, I am one of the chosen, but I fell off the wagon, but I'm going to be baptized again, which doesn't make any sense. And, and you end up with this, this very convoluted way of thinking that still is an effort to say what I do doesn't have any effect upon whether or not I'm saved. And yet if we look in the Gospels over and over again, we see Jesus explaining to us that if we are forgiven of much, we will love him much. And the more that we love him, the more that he will be able to use us and will be of service to him. And it just ultimately puts into, it calls into question so many different aspects of what Christianity is meant to be if we buy into the idea that what we do doesn't really affect salvation, that our choices don't mean anything. It just seems utterly inconsistent with the entirety of the Old Testament and all the teachings of Jesus. Now, the last her heresy or error we could call it when it comes to salvation is what we might call secular utopianism. The idea that we're all going to heaven anyway, and so all we really are doing here is to get along. And you see this with a lot of parishes where on the, on the, the, you, the bulletin, you know, and it says, we're a welcoming community of faith gag me. You see that kind of mentality and people are basically of the idea, look, everybody who's basically good is going to heaven. The only really bad people are the ones who are going to hell and really that's not many of them and hell's not that bad anyway. But you know, all of us basically good people, we're going to heaven and so we're not here to 
to get to heaven. We're not here to, to really grow in holiness. We're here as a community to share our experience and to worship and to love. And you know, that's the purpose of what we're doing here. We're, we're already kind of just working toward this kind of utopian kind of place in the world. And that we could call kind of a materialist way of thinking where we, we kind of assume universal salvation, that first error, and then we kind of just get into this materialistic way of saying, look, but what matters is not whatever the next phase is. Let's just do what we can here. And this is the folks who end up saying the most important thing about Christianity is social justice. The most important thing about Christianity is being engaged in the community. The most important thing about Christianity is what we do here and now rather than whether or not we are devoted to growing in holiness, to being sanctified by the Lord. And so these are four kind of, of errors that we might have when it comes to justification and salvation. So let's, let's not look at what is not the case. Let's look at what we actually believe about how folks get to heaven. The Catholic teaching is that the, the, the four last things, as we call them, are the four things we need to know in order to get to heaven. Now, death is the easiest one. The first is death. The second is judgment. The third is purgatory. And the fourth is hell. Death is relatively straightforward. Our bodies and our souls are created together, we are, or rather, our bodies and our souls are united together, one to the other, the soul as the form of the body, the body of the matter of the soul. Now, when we die, that union is broken. Our souls go up toward judgment, and our bodies decay into the earth. That's the way it plays out. That's what death means. And so when we talk about living and death, we're not necessarily talking about biological things. This is why it's somewhat confusing as a priest when I go to visit someone who has died and they say, well, can you anoint the family? And you have some of these quirky, or can you anoint the, uh, the deceased? And you have these quirky moments of, was well, the body still warm? How long have they been dead? It seems creepy, but it's extremely difficult because the people, you know, you would like to have some kind of gesture, some kind of physical manifestation of the faith of the church, and yet we have this difficulty whereas death is the separation of the body and the soul. And so the body still deserves a dignity because of what it has done, but death is a separation of the unity of body and soul. We believe that in eternity we will have eternal bodies or heavenly bodies that will so our souls and our body uh, souls in this new form of body will be reunited because we are made in our nature as body and soul spirit and flesh and even as even if we go to heaven as we are waiting for the, the second coming of Jesus Christ, we call the parousia, there is a certain sense of incompleteness until we are reunited with our body and soul. And I'll leave it to the expert theologians to talk about exactly how that works, why that is. But the idea is that death is the separation of body and soul. And the perfect unity of eternal life in heaven is the reunification of a heavenly body with that same soul. Judgment's a little more confusing. Uh, judgment, how do we get judged? Well, the first thing is to know is that judgment is not automatic. Judgment is not going up there and trying to trick St. Peter. Judgment is not a big pearly gate where you're trying to get your lockpick kit out. Um, judgment is effectively, it really does begin with faith in Jesus Christ and contrition of sin. And you have to have both. You can't go to heaven and say, look, I love me some Jesus. Um, that's, that's not enough. Loving Jesus is hugely important. But loving Jesus is not just what we love in our hearts and our emotions. It's also in our will and our choices. Because love, for a little philosophical point of view, is in the will. Love is effectively a choice. The feeling of love is an emotion, but the actions of love, sacrificing for that other person, wanting to make sure the other person, the good of the other, willing the good of the other, as we say, which is a traditional definition of love, that's something that involves what we do. And so we have to both love the Lord, have faith in the Lord, but then we also need to be repentant of any sins we have committed. Basically look at the Lord and say, Lord, I love you. Anything I've done in my life that is not for your glory, I am truly sorry for. And I'm not just talking about whip service. I'm talking about genuine sorrow for sin. This, the main point of judgment 
is faith and contrition or repentance. Now, there are a couple of, of gotchas there. There is a question of ignorance, like what if I didn't know this or that or the other was wrong? What if I was never taught about the Lord? How could I repent of something if I don't know if this is right or wrong? How can I love the Lord if I never knew him? And so you do have what we describe theologically as invincible ignorance. That is, I didn't know something and there was no good way for me to have known it. If I'm born on Mars and I've lived on Mars and I, you know, I, I die on Mars and I never ever met or encountered Jesus Christ at any level whatsoever, and there's no functional way that I could have encountered him, then I go before the Lord with invincible ignorance. And at that moment, I will be, what will be revealed to me is the complete reality and truth. Now, invincible ignorance is ignorance of things that I should have known, but simply didn't. You know, I've got a catechism sitting on my shelf that I got when I was confirmed, you know, 10 years ago, and I've never opened it once. And in there, there are teachings that I need to know as a parent or as a Christian, and I simply didn't take the time. I had a, uh, several weeks of sitting around at home during a quarantine. I never opened the book. That's vincible ignorance. And so we are held responsible for that sort of thing. Invincible ignorance is a different question. This is where the church starts to ask questions about what about those folks who are in a place that is viciously anti-Christian like China or where the Christianity that is taught is very, very just non-consistent with Christianity. What if I grew up in a vic vigorously and viciously Hindu home and all mention of Christianity was completely unacceptable and I never knew anything different? What if I grew up in an Islamic country Country, and it was illegal to have any teaching about Christianity, and I was absolutely indoctrinated from day one, is that, is, is, what, then I go to the Lord and I have this experience, what then? Now we should say, we don't know precisely what happens in, in terms of personal experience at the moment of death. We know in terms of the big picture of what happens, you know, you die, your body separates, you go to judgment, you are judged either up or down. If you're judged up, you go to purgatory and then to heaven. If you're judged down, you go to hell. That's the story. We know that basic flow chart and we know a good bit about each of the steps in that flow chart because the Lord has revealed them to saints, the Lord has revealed it in scripture. So we have a really good picture of what happens, but what we don't know is the personal experience. Now, one of the things that freaks people out, freaked me out the first time I thought about it and heard it, is what happens when I die and I become, what, what happens then because in this world I'm limited by time, right? I'm 22 minutes into giving this talk and the, I can't in my brain walk back 10 minutes. I'm stuck here and when this talk ends, it'll be over. You can watch it on video, but, but I'm limited by time. I'm also limited by words. I'm limited by what my brain can remember of the talk I've prepared. I'm limited by new things that come into my brain and choices I have to make while I'm talking. I'm also limited by the fact that I only know from my perspective, what's going on. You may be watching this video, you may be watching it today, you may be watching it what's for me a year from now, and I can't have any sense at all, just no possibility of knowing what effect this video will have, or what effect my sins have had, or what effect my virtues have had, or any of those things. I just can't know that. But when we die, we are no longer limited by time. We're no longer limited by the limitations of a mind attached to a human body. We're no longer limited by simply the knowledge that I gain from my perspective. What that means, and again, there are theologians who could explain this better, what that means is when I die, I will suddenly have access to all the knowledge there is to have. Now that means I'll know what happened with JFK in 1963. It also means that I'll know exactly what Julius Caesar liked to have for supper. It also means that I will know and be able to have a comprehension of that person that I was mean to when I was a seminarian teaching CCD in 1999. 
And that person I was mean to, and I was a seminarian teaching CCD in 1999, who may have looked at me and said, that guy's going to be a priest and he's a jerk. I'm leaving the church and I'll never be a part of the church ever again. I will become aware of that guy's whole story and what affects my bad decision to be rude in a random CCD class at, you know, whatever, what the effects of that decision would be. Now imagine how incredibly difficult it will be to be aware of everything. You, you go back to fifth grade when you accidentally hit somebody next to the playground and you go, goodness gracious, that affected that person's whole life. Or that random nice word you said to your neighbor when you were going into your apartment, that affected that person's whole life. And so dying does open up for us a, a spectrum of knowledge and a way of experiencing knowledge that is far beyond anything that most of us begin to imagine. And so judgment and the notion of vincible and invincible ignorance and the notion of contrition and repentance is not something that is as trivial as we tend to kind of think about it. Being made aware of all of those things means I need to have a disposition of repentance, a disposition of contrition, and a disposition of saying, Lord Jesus, you are Lord, you are God, and I am not. Otherwise, I could find myself in some real trouble when I go to judgment. And so this is not the kind of thing that's necessarily easy to explain, but death opens up this huge plethora of information. Judgment then being aware of all these things means going before the Lord and effectively it, it, the, the criterion we're looking for is faith in Jesus and repentance of sin. And so we need to, to build up that disposition now so that we're ready for when the moment comes. We don't earn our way into heaven, but we can be prideful enough to find our way into hell. Let's talk about the possibility of getting the thumbs up. We go to judgment, we're confronted with all of this information, all of this stuff. We're taken aback by it, we're overwhelmed by it, but we look at the Lord and say, Lord, you are God and I am not. If I have done anything that has not been for your glory, Lord, I repent of it. I absolutely repent of it. I don't want to do anything to do with it. It was, I, it was all my fault. You are God and I am not. And we have that disposition deep within ourselves, and so the Lord goes, thumbs up which is what we're shopping for, outstanding. So we get the thumbs up. What happens then? Well, unless we are just perfect, I mean perfect, we are going to spend some time in purgatory. Why? Well, because St. Paul in Romans reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in fact, we could find a hundred scripture references for the reality that all of us have personal sin. Every single one of us, no matter how much we're trying, no matter how, how good we are, even if we read something like St. Teresa, uh, Therese of Lisieux, who talks about how she was driven bonkers by the nun with, you know, who was flicking her nails or the nun who was messing with her hairbrush. And you think, this is a saintly little woman, and yet here she is confessing sins. Not sins that I would think are that big of a deal, but sins all the same. And so everybody... Everybody with, with, I would expect, you know, a dozen exceptions in history, kind of everybody, is going to go to purgatory. Now, we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus tells us that only the pure in heart shall see God. That only, the, the, and, and in fact, goes further to explain that, that ultimately if we were to look upon the face of God in our current, current conditions, we would die for all eternity. It just can't be done. And so we have this, these two kind of ideas that require some kind of, of middle that we don't understand. And so we have the idea on the one hand that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and on the other hand that only the pure of heart shall see God. And so what we posit is a purification, a process of being made ready to go from this moment of judgment to the moment of entering into heaven. The process of purification we just use the Latin word for purification, which is purgatio. And so we talk about how we get from point A to point B. Now, several saints have seen purgatory and have written extensively about it. At the end of the day, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1030 and 1031, do a great job of explaining it. They say, all who die in God's grace and friendship 
but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their sal eternal salvation. But after death they undergo purification, so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. And then 1031, the church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. Now, purgatory is not something that we need to overcomplicate. It's going to be a little different for every one of us. It's going to be dependent upon what process of purification we need. Just as if I'm trying to lose weight, my exercise and diet plan is going to be different than my sister. If my sister wants to lose weight, she's going to have to have an entirely different diet and exercise plan. She's got kids. She's got work. She's got other things I don't have. And so just like my diet plan would be different from anyone else's, so too my plan that God has for me to get from judgment to eternal life is going to be different for every single one of us. It's not overly necessary to become, to be, to become uh, deeply concerned with what purgatory would be like. The most important thing to realize is everybody who goes there is going to heaven. Everybody who goes there knows they're going to heaven. Everybody who goes there is genuinely repentant of their sins and has a, a utter faith utter trust in Jesus Christ. And so it's something akin to that senior football player, you know, who goes to see the coach and the coach says, I've got an entirely new exercise routine for us for spring training. And so everybody's going to come in and bring to do all this workout. And that guy's there and he's lifting weights at six in the morning on a Saturday in the summer. And he thinks to himself, why am I doing this. And the coach comes by and the coach says, because this is how we're going to win the state championship. And because that player trusts that coach and because that player knows that coach is doing what he's doing for his good and because that player believes they can win the state championship, he's there at 6 a.m. every morning lifting weights, miserable, hot, sweaty, because he trusts that the coach knows what's truly right for him. So purgatory is not something that we need to think of as something hell-like. Purgatory is a place that we're going to be excited to be, even if it is a kind of suffering, because we trust and we love the Lord and we know that he is going to bring us into eternal life in heaven. So purgatory is one of these places where we don't need to be overly upset that our loved ones are there. We do want to pray for them. We want to get them out of purgatory as quickly as we can. But y'all, everybody who is there knows they're going to heaven. And so we want to pray for the poor souls. They are suffering there, but at the same time, they're suffering with a great sense of hope. And so it's not a good idea, I think, to get ourselves into an absolute panic and say, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. We do love the holy souls. We want to pray for them. But I think it's, it's not helpful for us to get, get into the idea that it is hell-like. And in fact, the catechism goes out of its way to say it's not hell-like. Now, heaven. Heaven is where we all want to go. It's the result of purgatory. There is no time there. Uh, there's no such thing as time. Everything is one eternal moment. And so there is not as if, you know, I'm going to spend Monday in heaven doing this and Tuesday in heaven doing that. It is not the good place. Uh, it is not a place that has, you know, diners with pie that tastes delicious but has no fat. Uh, it's not a place where, you know, there's a 5K uh, next week. It is a place that is utterly timeless. And heaven is all about being utterly and completely united to Jesus Christ. It's about an intense union with Jesus Christ. There will be physical bodies. We call them redeemed bodies, as I mentioned. The reuniting of our, our human nature as body and soul. Uh, we will have utterly limitless knowledge. Uh, there is no such thing as something I don't know. Uh, some people talk about, well, is my dog going to go with me to heaven? And this is somewhat confusing. It's somewhat difficult because right now, Let's talk about my dog. I had a dog when I was growing up named Lady, Golden Retriever. Loved Lady. She died when I was about 10. Um, absolutely loved Lady. Lady, in my memory, is limited to maybe two dozen special memories, you know, rolling around in the grass with a Golden Retriever. You know, it's a wonderful memory, but I have maybe two dozen memories from back then of Lady. And they're fuzzy memories because they're 30 years old. When, please God, when I'm in heaven, please God, um, no, seriously, please, God. Uh, when I'm in heaven, my experience, because my knowledge is no longer limited in any way, every time I, I, I think about Lady, and I say time, and that's confusing, and set that aside, but 
lady will be as real to me as if she were right there because my memories of her are not clouded. They're perfect knowledge. And so my random spider, or not my spider crab, my, uh, this hermit crab I had when I was seven, whose name I don't even remember, I will be able to have perfect experience of, that, of every moment with that crab uh, just as I'm having experience of looking at the script in front of me because that's the nature of knowledge in heaven. Here, our knowledge is limited by time. In heaven, it won't be. So is Lady the Golden Retriever going to be in heaven? Not the way we're thinking. She's not going to be running around heaven. Her soul does not exist anymore. It is gone. But the knowledge of her and what we could talk about in the Thomistic realm of the, de the, the dependent knowledge of her will exist in heaven. And so somewhat confusing, but, but at the end of the day, will pets be in heaven not separate from the memories of their owners? No. Uh, let's talk for the one, one more time about, uh, or rather come around to an analogy that St. Augustine uses that I like a lot. Um, uh, and I, I've, I've adapted this a little bit to be a bit more modern, but I want you to think about somebody you love. You know, maybe somebody uh, who you, you, a family member that you love, maybe someone you're in a romantic relationship with that you love, but let's just think about somebody you love, and you love, love, love them. You know, so I'm going to, I'll bring to mind, you know, some person, and I absolutely love this person. Now, if I'm just sitting there with that person and I'm in love, we're not just talking about, you know, having some affection. I mean, love this person. And so I look into that person's eyes and I just feel like I could stay here forever. I know they love me. I love them. We're loving each other. We're just in love. And I could just stay there forever and ever and ever. That is probably the closest thing that we can think of in terms of, of an emotionally gripping example of what heaven would be like. We look at the Lord, we know that we are loved at the depths of ourselves, we love the Lord in return, and we just want to spend eternity being loved that way. That's close to what we think about with heaven. Now, conversely, I want you to think about that same love, but I've done something wrong. Maybe I've cheated on that person. Maybe I have lied to that person. Maybe I have so done something to hurt that person. They don't know it. I know it. Now, or I should say, let, let's, no, let, let's, let's, let's make it clear. They, <laughs> I've been confusing. We're in love. I've done something wrong. They know that I've done something wrong. And so I look into that person and I feel guilty. I feel terrible. I feel like a horrible human being. The other person, knowing what I've done wrong, looks back at me with complete forgiveness and love. But I still am just, I haven't forgiven myself. I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm prideful, whatever. And I look at that person and they love me and their love is just pouring out of them. And I look at them and I feel like an absolute doofus, a terrible human being. Now we get a better sense of what purgatory is like. Because purgatory is basically saying the Lord's loving me so much, but because of my own issues, because of my own stuff, because of my failures that I am trying to get rid of, but that it, for at this moment I'm not ready to offload, I am separated from the one who loves me, and they're loving me, and I can't love them, but not because of them, because of me. So you see how that would be purgatory-like, because I am in a situation where my own issues are preventing me from loving and being loved. That's closer to what we think of with purgatory. Now, this is not some kind of canonical example. It's sort of like when we talk about the Trinity and the three-leaf clover. There's, this, the three-leaf clover is not the Trinity, but there's some analogy that helps. So if we're thinking about this person we love, if I love them, they love me, there's nothing between us, that's what heaven is like. Purgatory, they love me, they know I've sinned against them, but I can't get over my own issues, and so I'm trying to get over my issues, that's what purgatory is like. Now let's talk about hell. Hell would be basically saying, you were in the, you know, looking at that person and saying, I know I did stuff that was wrong, but I stand by it. I'm right and you're wrong, and I know you love me, and I appreciate you love me and all that, but I think I was right, and I get cocky, and I have no intention of repenting for what I did to that person. Now, being forced to look at that person who loves me and absolutely hating them for it, 
is, is hell. That's what hell is like. It's spending all eternity being loved by the Lord and despising the love that he's giving because I am convinced that I knew what was best. I'm convinced that this sin or that choice or whatever was, was, what, was the right thing to do, and I am not repentant. I am not sorry for my sins, and I know better than God. And so in a real way, hell is this kind of deeply personal way of being separated from the Lord. Now, theologically speaking, hell is suffering, but it's not so much suffering by standing around in a lake of fire. That's a great image uh, of suffering, but at the end of the day, it's about being separated from God. It's about the Lord loving us and us being unwilling to be loved by him. And this is why we can talk about a good and loving God who will send people to hell, not to exclude them from his love, but because they exclude themselves from his love. Now, I should say, this is not some kind of deep theological explanation. There is quite a lot of deep theological explanation out there if you want to go down that road. But as far as understanding how we get to heaven and how we are saved, we can, we can go right back up to that initial thing of saying justification and salvation are ultimately about the Lord removing from me the, the punishment I deserve for sin because of my repentance and because of God's mercy. And if I reject that mercy or I reject that, re I refuse to offer that repentance, then I'm in a situation where there's not a whole lot I can do, but there's not a whole lot God can do about it. You know, God could theoretically forcibly remove my will from me, but then I would just be a robot, and in fact, I would not be capable of loving, because love is in the will, as I said. So just a quick rehash, we have justification and salvation. We talked about some of the common errors of the world, especially universal salvation, which is not what the church believes. We talked a little bit about the idea of, of coverage uh, and of, of predestination of being saved. Um, we talked about the Catholic teaching of death, which is the separation of body and soul, of judgment, which is, you know, the place of being confronted with this, this knowledge, this vast knowledge, and, and how it's so important to have a disposition of repentance of sins and faith in Jesus Christ. We talked about purgatory being a necessary condition of the fact that we have sinned, and yet none but the perfectly pure can enter into eternal life, and so we need this purification phase. We talked about how it is particular to each and every one of us. We also talked about how uh, purgatory is a place we want to pray for folks there, but we don't need to get ourselves too, too caught up in, oh gosh, I can't believe Aunt Judy is there. I need to get her out of there as quickly as possible because everybody there, just like that athlete, knows that what they're doing has purpose and value. And as suffering as it may be, it's a suffering these people would willingly endure as a way, of, as an extension of their love for Jesus Christ. We talked about how heaven is not limited in any way, shape, or form, certainly not limited by time, and that ultimately it is near unto being totally and completely drawn up into an ecstatic moment of love with Jesus Christ. We talked about how purgatory is about being in love with someone but having our, our love for that person interrupted by my own issues. And then we talked about how hell is ultimately a, a permanentization of that. I'm not trying to deal with my issues. I believe I was right and God was wrong. And so I'm spending eternity separated from him. And because there is no such thing as time in eternity, once that decision is made, that decision is made. I don't, you know, in 10 years look up and go, you know, I've changed my mind. Judgment happens outside of time. Heaven happens outside of time. Hell happens outside of time. And so a good and loving and merciful God will want to do the very, very best that he can for people. He will want to extend his love as much as he can. But if someone rejects that love, by nature, he can't remove the will of that person because if he does, he removes their capacity for love and effectively turns them into a robot or into uh, something which, which is itself not human. And so you ultimately destroy the integrity of being made in the image and likeness of God when you remove our capacity to love freely. And so lots and lots and lots to think about. Uh, this video, uh, hopefully you can watch it again. Um, 
provides you know a lot of different thoughts there's some definite avenues if you want to go think about and consider more broadly some theological things there's a lot of theological explanations out there of heaven hell death purgatory judgment uh, eternal life justification and salvation certainly recommend you look into some of those things please feel free to contact me on Twitter or Facebook if you have questions you can certainly comment wherever you're watching this post uh, and I'll respond to your comments there and let's continue to pray for each other as we make our way through this quarantine. Hopefully you have a wonderful afternoon and I will see you again uh, whenever I see you again. God bless you.